So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking at Daniel 11, verse 37 to 39, in the present truth application. But before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all that you do in our lives. For the things that you teach us, that reveal to us our need of you. We know we are frail and faulty human beings. We know, Lord, that uh, the work that you have begun in us is not completed yet, but we ask that you can complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And we pray that we can be an influence uh, to those around us, that we can cooperate in your work, not just in our own lives, but in the ministry that you have uh, to all humanity. We pray, Lord, that uh, you can be with each person who is studying these truths. We pray that you can be with Dwight and his family, his mom at this time. And um, I pray, Lord, that you can help us in the decisions that we make each day, that they will be uh, decisions that glorify your name. We ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts as we open your word together. Help us to understand these things and to correct uh, the things that we don't understand. Um, with the mistakes that we have made in our understanding. Thank you, Lord, for being here. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, there's Dwight. Hi, Dwight. Morning. So, yeah, you okay there, Dwight? I'll be all right. Okay. So, um, uh, we're looking at these verses again. So there are some things we have to change. I spent a bit of time. So we had some questions that were left unanswered, and we're going to look at those in detail. And um, the questions that were unanswered have to do with the word estate. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, it says in the King James. Uh, but, but we have the God of fortresses um, that is often suggested. Now, we're going to look at that word fortresses and the God of fortresses, what how that's used in scripture, and also a bit more about the state. But before we do that, I just want to go back and look at the preceding verse. Now, in doing this, we can see that there is these three aspects that this person uh, in historically papal Rome doesn't honor uh, the pagan gods. He rejects the everlasting gospel, and he doesn't regard any god. But in the present truth application, we had modern Rome, which includes the USA, UN, and Vatican. But as we were going through this, uh, we get this he for the, the man of sin, Satan, it, instead of the Pope. And, and what I'm thinking here, and I don't know, um, as I thought about this, prayed about it, studied it a bit, I really think that in, in this, uh, present truth application that that papal Rome is typifying Satan or uh, so because Satan is really the man of sin we, we can say you know the Pope is the man of sin in a sense but really Satan is the man of sin and in the present truth application this more becomes a conflict uh, between uh, Satan and God's people, the 144,000. And, and so I'm going to say here that, that this is just Satan, uh, that papal Rome is typifying Satan. Now, now Satan, of course, is being represented through, uh, the auspices of something, right? So Satan is not there personally in this history at this point. So in this history, dealing with the Sunday law and all, all the different things. So it's going to be through the auspices of, right, the, this would be like the papacy, uh, the USA, and the UN, right? So Satan, so in, in taking this in the present truth application, this is just my suggestion, but neither shall he, that is Satan, um, and I guess I should write through the auspices of, I don't know why I have papacy capitalized. I never do that. The papacy, USA, and the UN, he shall, that is Satan, through the auspices of papacy, UN, and uh, the United States. 
uh, so the papacy U.S. and the U.N., regard the gods of his fathers. Now, now of course, in the historical application, the gods of his fathers are, are the pagan gods, right? So papal Rome isn't going to acknowledge these pagan gods, right? But in this present truth application, if this is Satan through the auspices of the papacy, USA and UN, if he doesn't regard the gods of his fathers, well, obviously, we, we wouldn't just say pagan and papal Rome. We would say something something different. I mean, it would include pagan and papal Rome. But Satan is not acknowledging the gods of his fathers. Uh, so that is, um, you know, any type of God, right? Right. Nor the desire of women, right? And, and and not regard any god. So I, I guess maybe this pagan and papal Rome would still work. That is, um, but if we're talking about Satan, obviously the gods of his fathers. I mean, Satan doesn't have a father, but because historically this is addressing papal Rome and pagan Rome, so may, maybe that's still okay to leave that there. I, I just don't, you know, if we're talking about Satan's fathers, this would be. I guess in this context, I guess pagan and papal Rome would work. I mean, they're not really, he doesn't have any father per se, but he's going to reject in the end, all of these types of gods, the pagan and papal Rome gods, right? The, the true gods, you know, through the everlasting gospel, the Christian God, the Protestant God, and also uh, the secular God, any type of God, Satan himself, for he is the man of sin that magnifies himself above all. So this is Satan's personation of Christ. I don't know how to, maybe people understand this and maybe we could have discussion on it. But that's what I wanted to clear up is that first part. And, and I think this still works. So it's not the papacy, the USA and the UN, just that papal Rome represents. It represents this, this he represents Satan through the auspices of the papacy, USA, and UN. But does that make sense to people? Yes, it makes sense. And you should include in there part of, part of the spirit of prophecy where she's actually talking about Satan coming in and impersonating Christ. Okay. So, um, yeah, so let's, let's address that there. Now, in the great controversy, of course, we have that and other places. Um, so the first place, uh, the place that I know the best. Now, this is in the chapter, The Time of Trouble. Now, the one thing that uh, here, I'll just share the screen. So one of the things that that I found early on when I became an Adventist. So I was still in my early 20s as I got baptized when I was 19. Uh, so, you know, like a month, a month and a half before my 20th birthday. And so in my early 20s, as I started to study Adventism and, um, you know, hearing about like the close of probation and hearing about Satan's personation of Christ um, and, and how Adventists perceived this, I found that the literature wanted to put Satan's personation of Christ before the close of probation. And this came from a, a logic that was a misreading of a text, that he would deceive, if possible, the very elect. And so people somehow, and I'm not sure how they took that rhetorical statement, to say that means some of the very elect are going to be deceived. And of course, that would be a contradiction. The, the very elect are not going to be deceived. Uh, it's He would deceive, if possible, and, and we would have to say it's impossible. It is something that Satan was attempting to do. Now, in the chapter, The Time of Trouble, we know the time of trouble is talking about events that are happening after the close of probation. And, and Sister White says here, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ, the church has long professed to look to the Savior, Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now, and, and so the context now, that is not 
now in this time, but now in the time in which he's talking during the time of Jacob's trouble. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth. Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. As Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth, his voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he is blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes from the least to the greatest give heed to these sorceries saying, this is the great power of God. Now, we can see that it's an almost overmastering delusion. Uh, but she says, but the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled, unmingled wrath shall be poured out. And furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's second advent. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wherefore, if they say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. His coming, there is no possibility of counterfeiting. It will be universally known, witnessed by the whole world. Now, so so we we can see here that this personation of Christ. Uh, I mean, I could it talks here about uh, you know prior to that the personation of Christ, all of the different things uh, that are going to occur. So we can see that this is going to be during the time of Jacob's trouble after the close of probation. Now, um, is there another uh, quote, Angela, that you would want to look at in more that you're thinking of other than this one? Uh, I would like to look at that, all, all of them. Like, I'd like to review it, review it all. But that's me. I mean, I don't expect you to put hordes <laughs> of quotes in this manuscript. Okay. But I think that folks who are not as SDAs or don't know this stuff or do say it would be good for them to read it. Yes. I mean, it really shocked me when I read it. It, it. it was just absolutely astounding the first time I read it. Very controversy. Yeah. Um, so this is a, like a collection here of different things. Selected message. The enemy is preparing to assume a person who gains would like to personate Jesus Christ. I don't like, you know, reading stray statements out of context. Last day's events got some statements. His last strategy is to personate Christ. Um, that's again from last day events. Okay. Um, another statement. Oh, this statement here. I'm familiar with this. Review and Herald, November 19th, 1908. Okay, so this is the one. Um, just dealing with the studies that we were doing on Friday night with A.T. Jones. Because remember, A.T. Jones in May of 1909, he's going to... Um, make this presentation before the general conference uh, on an appeal for evangelical Christianity. And this is the statement I was looking at. Now she makes this statement before that general conference. Uh, it's published in November 19th, 1908 in the review and Herald. Uh, and this is the statement I remember that somebody pointed out to me and tried to connect this with uh, A.T. Jones presentation. Well, pardon me. So this is actually from letter one, 1897. Okay, so this is the one I found before. So somebody had tried to connect this. So it's not the bottom part. This is the top part. 
unless it's republished in 1908 in the Review and Herald. I don't know. I'm going to have to check the source here. In 1897. So some people tried to connect this with A.T. Jones. Um, but here in the statement, rebellion and apostasy are in the very air we breathe. We shall be affected by it unless we, by faith, hang our helpless souls upon Christ. If men are so easily misled, how will they stand when Satan shall personate Christ and work miracles? Who will be unmoved by his misrepresentations, professing to be Christ when he is only Satan, assuming the person of Christ and apparently working the works of Christ? What will God's people, what will hold God's people from giving their allegiance to false Christs? Go ye not after them. Um, the doctrines must be plainly understood. The men accepted to teach the truth must be anchored. Then their vessels will hold against storm and tempest because the anchor holds them firmly. The deceptions will increase. It's just talking here uh, in selected messages. So need for understanding doctrine. So obviously understanding that God's word is, is the thing that is going to help us in that time. The, the point is that people presently are easily deceived and they're deceived because of their lack of understanding of God, God's word. So, so we need to now study the scriptures if we're going to stand in that time. So just more that we need to watch. Yeah, that statement we've seen. Okay, same statement. Same statement. When Jesus was on earth, Satan led the people to reject the Son of God and chose Barabbas, who in character represented Satan, the God of this world. The Lord Jesus Christ came to dispute the usurpation of Satan in the kingdoms of the world. The conflict is not yet ended. And as we draw near the close of time, the battle waxes more intense. As the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ draws near, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Satan will not only appear as a human being, but he will personate Jesus Christ, and the world that has rejected the truth will receive him as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He will exercise his power and work upon the human imagination. He will corrupt both the minds and bodies of men and will work through the children of disobedience. Fascinating and charming, as does a ser serpent. What a spectacle will the world be for heavenly intelligences? What a spectacle for God, the creator of the world, to behold. The form Satan assumed in Eden when leading our first parents to transgress was of a character to bewilder and confuse the mind. He will work in as subtle a manner as we near the end of Earth's history. All his deceiving power will be brought to bear upon human subjects to complete the work of deluding the human family. So deceptive will be his working that men will do as they did in the days of Christ when and when asked, whom shall I release unto you, Christ or Barabbas? The almost universal cry will be Barabbas, Barabbas. And when the question is asked, what will ye then do? What will ye then that I shall do unto him? Will ye call the king of the Jews? The cry will be, again will be, crucified. Christ will be represented in the person of those who accept the truth and who identify their interests with that of their Lord. The world will be enraged at them in the same way that they were enraged at Christ. And the disciples of Christ will know that they are to be treated no better than was their Lord. But Christ will surely identify his interest with those, with that of those who accept him as their personal savior. Every insult, every reproach, every false accusation made against them by those who have turned their ears away from the truth and are turned unto fables will be charged upon the guilty ones as done to Christ in the person of his saints. So, so if we think about this for a bit, now, one of the things, you know, before I became an Adventist, I was a Christian already. I'd become a Christian, being converted. And the thing that... That when I first heard about Adventism, that sort of made me not consider Adventism. So I, I knew Kelly Ross, he grew up, uh, well, I grew up, but I grew up sort of with him. When I was a teenager, he moved in uh, with my family for a couple of years. And, and he became an Adventist during that time. So, so I knew about Adventists. And then after I got married, 
I mean, Kelly came and visited me in 100 Mile House. Uh, I was living there for my first uh, six months of my marriage. And uh, when my son Matt was born. And um, so uh, when Kelly came and visited uh, that summer, I remember, you know, he was, we were talking about, you know, he was trying to convince me to be an Adventist and, and I, and I hadn't really looked into much. I mean, I hadn't been a converted Christian for long, though I had studied the Bible quite a bit. And then later on when I was uh, met another Adventist, uh, Norman Byers, um, and uh, at a health food store and, and started talking to him about Adventism. You know, my my whole, the problem that I had is that I didn't feel that the Adventism that I was presented with was very spiritual. Now, of course, I wasn't presented with much Adventism. You know, Kelly Ross was a relatively new Adventist, um, and so was Norman Byers. He had just been baptized, and they didn't really understand things very deeply. And And I'm not saying I was the deepest person in the world, but... I had had a long experience of searching for truth. I'd read a lot. And uh, this issue of like the Sabbath and Sunday issue, to me, it just seemed kind of superficial, you know. But as we look at this, one of the things that we see in the stories of Scripture is that those who follow the truth, it's not so much that they have an intellectual understanding of the doctrines of the Bible. Right. That they can recite, you know, some day Adventists who, who know the 27 fundamental beliefs or, you know, who attend church every Sabbath. Because many people who profess to believe Christ, who actually know the scriptures in some sense or another, are going to be deceived. And that's because they are actually and have actually always been following Satan, even in their profession of Christianity. Right. So that wasn't really clear to me back then. That, um, but as I started studying, I came to realize, even when I became an Adventist, that most of the people there in church were not really Christians. And, and of course, you know, that could sound a little bit arrogant. This new Adventist comes in. And, and, but I knew that many of them were not really truly spiritual. That is, they made a profession of believing things that were true, but in how they treated others and how they looked at themselves, um, they really were unconverted. Now, I'm not judging any individual person. I'm just saying that I could see that that existed within the church, that the, the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. And there were some people in particular, though, that I remember. I remember it was the, at the church I, I had joined. It was the church treasurer. And, you know, maybe I'm, you know, maybe it's my imagination. Maybe my view of people is, you know, faulty. But his family, him and his wife and his kids, appeared to be the most unhappiest people. And I, and I, I wondered about it. Like, there seemed to be no joy in their life. And, you know, maybe it's just personalities or something. But, you know, there is something about the truth that transforms a person. And in order to stand in the, in that last days, in order not to be deceived by Satan's personation of Christ, we need to know Christ. Right? We have to have this personal revelation of Christ. And I believe that if a person has this personal revelation of Christ, it will be seen and manifest in the life that the people around that person are going to know that there is something different about that person. Uh, does somebody, Dwight, did you have a comment? Your mic is on. No. Okay. My apology. That's okay. So when it comes to this, this issue, we, we see that there is Christ is represented in his people, the 144,000. His glory shall be seen upon him. His character is seen in this group of people. And they are hated because the other group doesn't have Christ. This is 
because of the everlasting gospel, the pro- proclamation of the everlasting gospel that goes to the world that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And so in our choices, in, in the decisions that we are making each day, in what we study, what we take into our mind, what we consider, we are developing a character. And that character is either going to be modeled after that of Christ or it's going to be after that of Satan. And we can easily deceive ourselves because of our beliefs, right? Because we believe the truth things and because we we see all the problems out there, right? We can see all the sin that exists in the world. And we can think that we're the ones crying and sighing for the abominations done in the land. And yet the abominations in our own lives, we are blind to. And so this, this issue as it relates to what we're studying here, uh, if we go back to uh, this document and we look at this, this present truth application of Daniel chapter 11, verse 30 to 7 to 39, it's describing the character of Satan in the last days, right? We're going to say that this is through these different mediums, uh, the papal power, the United States, the UN. Now, these, of course, are, um, and, and of course, we could just say, you know, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Uh, but they include a lot of different elements. So they include um, everything that the world has to offer, uh, the different organizations, the businesses of the world, the media, uh, like, um, you know, the, all of these, um, what do they call them? Uh, you know, the tech, tech corporations, all of these different things, you know, the WEF, every single power that is being manifested in the world that isn't manifesting Christ's character is manifesting Satan's character. And Satan is operating through these things. Now, so then if we're going to say, neither shall he, that is Satan, regard the gods of his fathers, now, we have their pagan and papal Rome, but really, if we're going to say who is the fathers in, in this context, maybe it's not the best word in, in the present truth application, but it's really just the gods of this world. All of these other gods, he's not going to regard them. That is, he is placing himself above them, right? And, and it's a rejection of the everlasting gospel. All of these agencies, the papacy, the United States, all the world that has been encountered with the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages, it, it has rejected that. And we can see that in, in everything that we see, that the world wants to have a form of godliness, and 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 people are always going to try to cloak themselves in some kind of righteousness, even if it's a very perverted righteousness, rather than to be clothed with Christ's righteousness. Right. So they they clothe themselves in this this man-made righteousness, the filthy rags. So. Well, that's what the spirit of Laodicea is. And I'm dealing with that on a daily basis. You know, I can really see the contrast. And why did Ellen White say? Only a remnant of a remnant will be saved. He said, not one in 20. I mean, it's very serious. Yeah. And so we need to recognize that the message to the Laodiceans is a message to us individually. Right. This is the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. That that God is speaking to us so that we can see that we are unlike Christ. Because we can imagine that we're good. I mean, people do that all the time. You know, you talk to somebody in in prison. Well, I mean, he could have done horrendous crimes, but, you know, he will have a justification for it unless the spirit of God is revealing to him that he is a sinner. But if but many people, even when they have done atrocities, can still consider themselves good. They can justify their actions and we can do the same thing. So when we look at. This manifestation, and we're trying to look at this, and, and this is a fairly, fairly broad application that we're giving here in this characteristic of, of what 
the papacy represents in our time. That is, we're not we're not bringing it down to very specific events or anything like that. We're just saying in this broadest sense, what the papacy represents is the spirit of Satan. And especially uh, that just as the papacy was set upon the throne of the earth, uh, Satan wants to be upon the throne of the earth. He wants to be upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. He wants to usurp Christ's throne. That is his his purpose. Now, remember, Ellen White talks about um, uh, when Christ moves from the holy to the most holy place. Uh, and the Protestants, now, of course, this is just symbolically represented, uh, but they're going to be praying to somebody in the holy place. So Satan is standing where he ought not, right? The abomination of desolation. So they're going to be praying to Satan, right? And he's going to breathe on them. Remember that uh, statement? I'm going to find it here. Um, yeah, I recall it quite well. And it's yeah. tough when you have to deal, deal with Protestants and you're trying to explain to them that Christ has, like, I haven't come to that point yet, but I'm going to very soon. Lord, helping me. And he's in the most holy place, you know. He is interested, like they say about Christ interceding for us. Well, where do you think he's interceding for you? Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Like, I think that's how I'm going to have to approach it. It's the only way. Okay, so this this is in um, early writings. So this, and I'm sure all of us here are familiar with it. Now, um, I saw the saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the holy of holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude, which he talks about earlier, after he arose, and they were left in perfect darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm, and we heard his lovely voice saying, wait here, I'm going to my father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while, I will return from the red wedding and receive you to myself. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire surrounded by angels came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the father sat. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the father. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. And those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holiest and pray, my father, give us thy spirit. When Jesus would breathe upon them, then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. I turned, I, I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. Now, of course, this is not literally occurring, right? This is a, a representation of something that has happened historically. But, but the point here is that we see that Satan has, has operated in a way that, that people can believe that they're worshiping Christ. But they're not following him to the most holy place. They're not following Christ. And, and we could look at this in the idea that the idea of justification by faith. You know, Jesus died for all, all men, all men are justified. And, you know, the idea of living a perfect life of righteousness is not needed. Um, the idea of, you know, so there's this condemnation by the church uh, in, in general against, um, what they call last generation theology, the idea that you need these, this final generation to represent Christ uh, before Jesus can come back when Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people. Then shall he come to claim them as his own. And there's sort of a denial of that by the church. Uh, they see that as a danger, as uh, something that brought in by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, some kind of fanaticism, right? So we studied that a little bit on Friday night. Studies dealing with the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. Uh, 
But here we can see that this, if we're looking at what happened historically with the papacy, uh, we can see that this is representing what is happening in the last days with Satan, right? Satan is the one who wants to be placed upon the throne of the earth. He is he's usurping that place. And in the holy place, so I don't say that Satan is literally in the holy place, but we know that the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, in the sanctuary, in the earthly sanctuary, when you, you know, you would go into the sanctuary, you would have to come first, you know, into the courtyard. There would be the altar of burnt offering, and then there would be the laver, right? And so this is symbolic, first the door of salvation, you know, where you slay the sacrifice and the blood is collected by the priest, and the priest mediates this for you. Uh, so the blood, you know, is the animal would be burnt at the at the altar. It depends on the different types of offerings. Blood would be poured out at the base of the altar. In some offerings, blood would be carried into the sanctuary. And, and of course, on the Day of Atonement, you're going to have two goats, the Lord's goat and Azazel, Azazel being uh, Satan, right? And this is going to represent the Lord's goat, I believe, represents Christ and the completed work of Christ in his people. And, and Azazel uh, represents Satan and his followers. Um, but, you know, primarily it's, it's Christ and Satan that they represent. But those that follow are, are going to choose one or the other. But it, when you get into the sanctuary itself, on the left side is the, <coughs> the seven branch candlestick in the wilderness tabernacle. In Solomon's temple, there would be seven of those. And then uh, on the right side is the table of showbread with the, the 12 loaves of bread, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. That throne on the right side, or that altar of the table of showbread, is Christ's throne that's seen in Revelation chapter 4. When you see one seated upon the throne that is before the lamp stands, right? So obviously that's Christ's throne. And we also have, you know, another throne. We would say it's the Holy Spirit's throne, which is the altar of incense. And then we have uh, the ark itself, which is the Father's throne, representative, right, of that. Now, Christ, of course, is permeated all through the sanctuary. It's all the work of Christ. So, I mean, you can say that, you know, the prayers of Christ, uh, the prayers of the saints, they're mediated by the blood of Christ, but Christ himself is the mediator. Um, and then, of course, you know, Christ is the true God, or, and so he's represented in the most holy place as well. But in, in some ways, right? But we do know that there's the Father in the most holy and Christ's throne is in the holy. And it moves from the holy to the most holy, right? That's what happens on the Day of Atonement. Christ begins his work in the most holy place. And that work is the final eradication of sin. That That's the whole basis of Adventism, is this idea that not only did Christ come and die for the sins of man, not only has he given us justification, by faith, but he's actually going to sanctify us. He's going to present us as a perfect church. There is going to be that final generation that is going to represent him. And that final generation is not going to see themselves as perfect. They're not going to perceive themselves that they have this character of Christ. They simply have it by trusting in Christ. But the world is going to hate them because of their character, not because of the doctrines they believe, not, not, you know, not because they eat a certain way or dress a certain way, but because of their character. That's what's going to be hated. And this is going to be in contrast to their own characters. The reason why the wicked hate the righteous is because of their own characters, right? Their characters are unlike Christ. This is the enmity right between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so those that are with Satan will hate the righteous. This, you know, Cain killed Abel. That is always going to be the case. So, I mean, this is kind of a long roundabout way to, but this is an important point to understand is that what happened during the Dark Ages is typical of what is happening now. And so we're looking at this in the broadest sense. So Satan in the last days, through the auspices of 
the papal power, you know, the beast, the United States, the false prophet, and the UN, the dragon power, is going to exalt his character above all of these other things. That is, it's not going to be about, you know, papal Rome and, and false gods, right? It's not going to be about, you know, Protestantism or, or you know, the WEF or the UN in, in a sense, right? That is, these are the mediums through which Satan is working. It's really about the character that is being manifest. What character is it that we are attracted to? And that can be manifest even in this movement. And, and we saw this in this movement, in how people were treated when they differed. And if we act in that same way, if we treat people in the way that we have been treated, it's, it's like the person who was uh, forgiven his debt, right? Remember, uh, he has this debt and um, he ends up getting forgiven. And, but then he, once he's released from debtor's prison or whatever, he, he finds somebody who owes him just a very little bit of money and um, he's unforgiving to him. Since we are forgiven by God and, and we believe the truth, we need to trust that God can take care of the truth himself. So the purposes of these things, the purposes that Satan has, isn't, you know, to promote the papacy per se, or to promote, uh, you know, evangelical Christianity, you know, that's, you know, the evil evangelical Christianity, the, the fake Christianity, or even, you know, the goals of the UN or the WEF. Those are not Satan's ultimate goals. These are simply tools that he uses so that the world will worship him, his character, because he believes somehow, you know, that he can win. I'm not, I'm not sure what winning looks like for Satan, uh, what he thinks it looks like, but part of winning is, is to create pain for Christ, like to take as many down with him as he can. So we have this very broad way of looking at things. So we're not, we're not focusing upon, you know, what the papacy is doing, papal Rome. I mean, it obviously represents the papacy, but it also represents the USA. It also represents the UN. But this is really about Satan. The he in the present truth application is Satan. So he's not going to regard uh, the gods of his fathers, these fake, God, uh, uh, fake gods, these pagan gods. He's not going to regard uh, the gospel, right? the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages. Those, those have been rejected. Or regard even any God. It doesn't matter. Any secular type of God. None of those things matter. For he, that is the man of Satan, in this case Satan, magnifies himself above all. Now, in this context, Satan wants to have supreme religious authority. He's personating Christ. And he's also going to then, in this next verse, this is what we have to study next. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces or fortresses and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Now, we can understand the historical application of that, but we still have some things about that that we have to address. So this is where we're moving into the next part. So I spent a lot more on that than I want to. Hopefully that's clear to people. I don't know if people have questions or comments about my little uh, speech there. Hopefully that makes sense to people that the issues are really one of character. Beliefs only really matter in the sense of how they manifest our character. People can have orthodox beliefs about an unchrist like character if they don't really truly believe those beliefs, if they're just a cloak. Okay, um, so we were looking at this word in his estate and we were discussing, well, is this in who is the his is here? Now, we also looked at the God of fortresses. Now, Angela brought up at the end of the study yesterday, and we're going to do the word study on it. So we'll, we'll deal with this first. Um, 
if we look up this this word, um, what should I write in there? Okay, so the word itself, ma'atz, sometimes ma'uz, so sometimes they put a vav in there. So it's mem, ein, tzadi, right? Now, sometimes they have an, a vav with a dot, so that gives it an u sound. You can see the different spellings here. Uh, ma, ma'utz, ma'az, ma'az, ma'utz, ma'utz. Okay? So they just show that there. So there's different ways it's spelled, and I don't know why. Could be just the, the time in which it's written. Now you're going to see that it's going to be translated as strength 24 times, strong five times, fortress three times. Two of those are in Daniel. One is in Jeremiah. A forces, uh, once in Daniel and fort also in Dan- Daniel 11, right? Is there in Daniel 11? And then a few different places hold in Nahum, holds in Isaiah, uh, most in Daniel 11:39. And that's just when you're dealing with the one that we're talking about, the most strongholds. Um, we're not specifically the one we're talking, because it talks about a state, but we're going to see that it's related to this other word. And uh, Judges 6.26, it's going to be translated as rock. Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, strengthen. Obviously, they're being used as a verb. Um, so if we go back to this one here, forces. Um, that's going to be a state. No. So that's forces I'm looking at. I want to look at a state first, right? Or was it forces? It was forces. Yes. Okay. Maz. That's the one I want to look at. Okay. Now, so in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces. And we said fortresses. But we can see that this word also is the one where it talks about the most strongholds, right? So you're going to see Maaz here as well. So... Um, and in this case, they're going to be another word, uh, mitzar, which means a fortification or castle. And that's why they translate it as most strongholds. Okay, so um, now the god of forces could be translated as the god of strength. So the idea there that Angela brought up is that this usually refers to the true god. Right, Angela? Is that what you were saying when you looked this up, Angela? I don't hear you, so I don't know. Anyway, she brought it up at the end of the study. So okay. if we if we looked at okay, Dwight, you have a comment? Okay, as as we had approached this in the past, the the way that the translators would have approached the first portion of the verse, instead of but in his estate, they would have had it as but in his stead, as for the Almighty God in his seat. He shall honor, yea, he shall honor a God whom. Okay. So, go ahead. Yeah. So they're going to, um, they're going to add like uh, a different. So they say in his estate, but in his stead. And then they have Hebrew. Right. But as for the almighty God in his seat shall be honor. Right. So they're taking this as my, like a contrast of two things. Right. Okay. And then, uh, then they come instead of God of forces, the alternate would have been God of munitions. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I don't think is a good translation of the word. Um, just because of all the places that it's used, it's used mostly translated to strength. Right. And usually the God, the God of Maaz, that is the God of strength. Right. So most of the time it refers to God is being the God of strength. That is, uh, the idea is that he is our refuge. He's our protector. So the idea is it's like a fortification. So munitions, I mean, I think of munitions, maybe I don't understand the word munitions, but more as as um, uh, related to ammunition. Right. Right. right? So, so that would be more a... Uh, you know, an attacking idea. The more the idea here is that it's more something to protect us. It's a refuge. So I, I don't really like the word munitions here, and it's just not translated that way anywhere in the King James. So, so the Hebrew is ma, ma, well, the Hebrew word is maaz, but here it's mausium, right? It's just in plural, right? 
So there's M at the end, Ma'uzin. And with, uh, that, with the Ma'uzin, as you're pointing out, the alternate Hebrew could also be saying God's protectors. Yeah. So, yeah. So if we look at this word, so let's, um, yeah. So it's a good thing you pointed that this things, these things out. So when we look at this word and we look at it in the Hebrew, so I'm just using the Hebrew here. Uh, you can see here, it's got this, uh, um, uh, if you can read Hebrew, it's got this little square at the end. That's, that's a, a final mim, right? So that's the, it's just the plural. It's got a yod and a mim because it goes from right to left. So ma'zim, ma'utzim. And, and so that's in the plural. But if we look at, uh, let's see, uh, another one. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a comparison. I'm just going to do this parallel. I'm going to just put the, the Hebrew next to, there we go. So I just, so I can see both of them at the same time. So when we look at like second Samuel 22, 33, God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. You're going to see strength is, is, uh, it's just my strength. It's not in a plural form. Uh, Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of my life. Right? So again, it's just going to be, um, you know, the possessive, the, like the, my strength. Right? So where is this here? Uh, this one doesn't even, yeah. So this is not in the plural form. Right. So part of the thing about this verse is that it's in a plural form. So in like even in Daniel 11, verse seven, uh, we're going to see this word. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate. Now, we also got that estate there as well. Right. Which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. And, and we probably need to look up at that because the standing up in his estate. Is, is related to what we're looking at in this other verse as well. But again, in this one, you got, you got fortress. It's not going to be fortresses. It's just in the singular, right? So it's going to have, um, and let me see here. For some reason these verses don't line up at the Hebrew here, but yeah, this verse was written out differently in the Hebrew. Um, in, in the way that they divide the verses. So, yeah, I see what they do. Okay. Yeah, again, it's in the singular. Okay. So as far as I can, uh, we have Isaiah 23, 11, which translates it in a plural. Um, but again, in Isaiah 23, verse 11, this one is going to say, um, he stretched out his hand over the sea and shook the kingdoms. The Lord hath given a commandment against the merchant city to destroy the stronghold. So here it's obviously not dealing with, you know, the God of strength. It's dealing with the strongholds. And a lot of times you look at it, it can refer to the stronghold, that the God is our stronghold, but also sometimes that this is a stronghold of a pagan God or a nation or country. And, and in this one, it's written in, it's not really, uh, it's a different form. I'm not sure the form, because it's got Miha at the end, not Ma'otzi at Miha. Same, same Hebrew word, but a different form that I'm not familiar with. I think it looks like it's a feminine plural. The strongholds also stand for the holds that Satan has on people, how he implants his character, his intentions, mm-hmm. his behavior into people yes yeah i know so that's why we got to sort this out we got to make sure that we got this uh correct so i just want to look at this form of this word i'm just looking at the parsing of it um they they don't seem to actually be able to in my scholars gateway they're not able to parse it (laughs) i don't think they just they say it's a masculine plural, but it's definitely a form I'm not familiar with. 
because it's ma'atz, and at the end they have a noon, a vav, and a he. And I'm not sure what that ending means. But they're saying it's a, just another type of ma'uzanahaya. So I, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's, it's in a, that's the only one that's other one that's in a plural that I know of. Okay. So, so if we go back, uh, if we go Daniel chapter 11 and we're addressing this. So, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces or the God of strength. And we go to verse seven and we make this. But out of the branch of her root shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. So in this case, when when we looked at this verse, so let's go back here, way back in our notes, just historically how we understood this verse. But out of the branch of her roots, so that was Berenice's roots. Shall one that's uh, Ptolemy the third Eugetes stand up in his estate that he's he's going to assume the throne of Egypt, right? So it's just that's how we we understood this. Which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. Now here we have the fortress in uh, representing in, in present truth application the U.S. Constitution. Obviously here it's just. Uh, the king of the north, right? Uh, Seleucid Syria at the time. So we're, we're saying the fortress here is going to represent this refuge. If we're going to put it as a refuge, this is the U.S. Constitution. It's the strength of the United States. So that's the historical and then the present truth application of verse 7. So when we get back to verse 39 here, 38, whichever one it is, yeah, 38 but in his estate he shall honor the god of fortresses so his estate is this place we still haven't defined what that is in the present truth but in in the other example uh the place is is the place of the king of egypt right so he's just going to be take the throne of the king of egypt um, and then he shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. So, so we can say here, so, so when we deal with this fortress, we can say strength, but it's in the plural. So, so I don't think we can just say that this is the God of strengths. That is, it's not just, it's not just comparing the other phrases where it talks about the God of Ma'az, right? That this is that who he's going to honor, but in his estate, we still have to decide who his is. Shall he honor uh, the God of fortresses? So historically, we just say that this is the supreme civil authority, that that uh, the papacy is honoring uh, this civil authority. So the God of strength, right? But not the true God of strength. Right. That's the, that we didn't. He's not honoring the true God of strength. So if we just look at the historical. Now, when we looked at the, um, and I didn't share the screen here. So when we looked at the translators, how they tried to translate this verse. And, and I can see why they're trying to translate it differently. They're trying to make sense out of this. Right. So they're saying, but in his stead or in his place. And then they're saying the Hebrew says, but as for the almighty God in his seat shall be honor. Yea, he shall honor a God. Okay. Now, I don't know if that makes any sense. The the alternate reading that the translators used. What are they trying to say by that? But, uh, but as for the almighty God, so they're saying, but as for the almighty God, so they're reorganizing the sentence. In his seat, in the place of the Almighty God, they're going to honor uh, a God whom they knew not. So in some ways that that makes sense, but I'm not sure if it makes sense from the Hebrew or not. Do people understand what the translators are trying to do? Now, in the Hebrew, the way that the sentence is organized, 
It actually starts with the word uh, God, Eloa. So it can be translated usually as God Almighty or you know, the, the true God or, or a false God. So it's, it's a rare form. So it's not Elohim. It's just Eloa. Uh, and then it has, uh, so it starts with the God of forces or the God of strength. The God of strength, and then it says uh, the five nine two one word is the next is the third word, right? Which can which is being translated as um, but in, right? Okay, where here it's going to have so it's going to have the God of forces first, and that's why they say but as for the Almighty God, right? That's that's how they're translating that. The God of forces, but as for the Almighty God, in his estate or in his seat, shall they honor the God, uh, the gods who they knew not. Lord, let me see. Why do they have not? Um, yeah, so I don't understand their, yeah, God whom their fathers knew not. Okay. So maybe that makes sense. I mean, if we retranslated this as the alternate reading, it's not that he's honoring the God of fortresses. It's just they're saying, but for as the God of fortresses or the true God, the God, almighty God, in his place. Now, so this goes back then to this word in his place. Right, in his estate. So I was suggesting that we had uh, two possible readings of this. Uh, we could say in his estate, his estate is in the place of Christ, right? Or in his estate that is in the place of, uh, like for the historical application, in, in, in the place of Rome, right? In his place. So this would be either, either be Rome, the his would be either Rome itself, that, that is the papacy's place, Rome, or it would be Christ's place. But if we take it the way this alternate reading is, um, it resolves that problem. So we just say, for as for the true God, the God of the almighty God in his estate, that is in the place of almighty God, he, that he's going to honor, that is, the, the papacy is going to honor the God whom his fathers knew or not, right? So in this case, it's, we're not dealing with the, the true, it, I, I don't know how to explain it. Does, does that make sense? So if we translate this, so let's, let's try to do this here. We're going to give the alternate reading of this verse. Um, so I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to put verse 38 out by itself. And I'm going to put an alternate reading in here. I'm going to take the translator's reading. So they have, but as for the almighty God in his seat shall be honor. Now, I don't know. I would actually put he. Shall he honor? Yea, he shall honor a God whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, stones. And that's how I would translate. I just changed. And, and this makes sense. But as for the almighty God, in his seat shall he honor. Yea, he shall honor a God whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, precious stones. And pleasant things. So that's just an alternate reading of that. Now, if that's if this reading is correct, then in his seat or place, what what is this seat? Is, is this seat Rome, right? Historical application, or is this seat some other place? And and I, I would actually even just go through. I mean, I know they have the honor twice there. He shall honor, and he shall honor. That's why they put the two honors there. But they're just taking that and moving around. Okay, so that makes sense. 
So whose seat is it? Uh, first of all, in uh, 37, it's saying, uh, uh, there is a uh, here where it's saying, uh, no regards any God, which simply means here I'm seeing that uh, he's got uh, no respect to yeah. like any, yeah, any religion. Then uh, 38, it's a bringing in his position, shall he honor uh, the gods of uh, forces and the God whom his fathers knew not. Yes. Uh, even and uh, with uh, precious stones and uh, so when uh, we look at Pagan Long, I'm I'm looking at maybe uh, what of uh, the Pantheon. You're looking at what? Uh, uh, the the Pantheon. Pantheon. Oh, the Pantheon. Okay, right. So we see well in in so that's where we have this this problem. So it says so if we're taking the translators. Because originally we would look at it as the pantheon in Rome, right? For pagan Rome. That, that's how we were looking at it, is the state. Um, okay. Right? Which I would agree. Now, here, though, in the translator's alternate translation, but as for the almighty God, now they had, okay, just to be fair, they had, in his seat shall be honor, right? But But I'm not sure that that's correct. That is, they're saying the almighty God, there's still honor in his seat. But but that doesn't seem to, to work out. Now, what I'm saying is that in the place of God is going to be honored a false God. That, to me, is the idea here. That, that this seat, this place that is in the place of God, that is in God's seat, he's that, that this power, the papal power historically, is going to honor a God whom his fathers knew not, right? That is these idols. But it's, so the seat here wouldn't be the pantheon in this context, because this is talking about the seat of the almighty God. That is, we know in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that when it talks about the man of sin, he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing that he is God, right? So if we're going to take what the alternate translators have said, it's not that there's going to be honor in his seat, that there will in his seat there shall be honor. It's in his seat he shall honor. Yea, he shall honor, that is the papacy, is going to honor a false god in the place of Christ, right? That's the idea. So, okay. so we have, we have this uh, this this idea with this seat. You know, we can say seat, we can say estate, we can say place, whatever. Uh, we have to decide: is this seat Rome with the Pantheon, right? That temple, or is this talking about Christ's seat? That is the place of Christ, his temple. And we know Second Thessalonians says this. Now, we're going to have to deal with this, you know, more tomorrow. Right. So on Thursday, it's today's Wednesday. Um, so we're going to have to deal with this more tomorrow. But the one thing that that we. OK, so we know about the false view of, view of the daily. Right. So the new view of the daily that took over Adventism in the early part of the 20th century. That view we know is satanic, right? The idea that Christ um, is cast down to the earth. Now, that that doctrine um, of, of the daily, the tra- daily and the transgression of desolation, Ellen White is laying out the true view of that in chapter three of the Great Controversy, when she's addressing 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So what we're studying right now is we're studying 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're studying from verse 31 to verse 39. We're studying uh, the removal of the daily and the setting up of the papal power, correct? That's what we're studying. That's what Daniel chapter 11 
verse 31 to 39 is addressing. It's addressing that. And, and up to verse 40, verse A, it's going to address the end of that. And, and we can see how that flows from what we had studied even earlier in verse 30, right? So we understand now that, that this is dealing with these two, um, uh, like the, 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 the indignations, right? The daily and the abomination of desolation or the transgression of desolation. And the last end of the indignation, right? It's going to be that period of time uh, to the time appointed. So that's Millerite history, the 45 years. And so if we're taking these verses 37 to 39 and we're understanding them in that context, it seems to me that the seat here, even though in, in Daniel chapter 8, we looked at that, it's going to talk about the pantheon, right? But here this is talking about this transition where Satan wants to sit in the seat of Christ. Now, we have this problem with this 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 God of fortresses. If it is referring to, but as for the Almighty God, then it says in his seat, the his would be Almighty God's seat. Shall he, that is the papacy, honor a God whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, precious stones and pleasant things. So that seat then would be the seat of Christ, the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north that Satan is ultimately seeking. But here in this in this context, historical application, that seat is just generally the sense of the place of Christ. Now, now the reason why the new view came about was partly because they didn't understand the old view. And they had when, when the old view was given, they didn't have an understanding of Christ as our heavenly high priest, at least not in the way that we did after 1844. So the understanding of the sanctuary and Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary uh, became uh, basically new light. I mean, it was always there, uh, but it just now opened up everything in regard to uh, the, the work of Christ in heaven. Right. So now we saw the need of the Day of Atonement as a period of time in heaven. That's why we're Seventh-day Adventists. We believe that, right, that there is this the Day of Atonement. We're in the time of the Day of Atonement. Other Christians have no concept of that. So, so Christ is our high priest ministering in the, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And when we have this move from the daily, which is a counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary to the transgression of desolation, which is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary, the mistake that the new view makes is it tries to say, well, the thing that needed to be removed in order for the man of sin to be revealed right? Comparing to second Thessalonians, because they're going to interpret second Thessalonians as the thing that needs to be removed is Christ's heavenly ministry. Uh, they do that in the quarterly on Thessalonians in uh, the last, uh, it's the last quarter of 2012, the Sabbath school quarterly. Uh, they're going to, to make that statement. That is, they're going to interpret second Thessalonians in a way it has never been interpreted before within Adventism. So in 2012, they do that. Um, so if you look up the old Sabbath school quarterly on Thessalonians, the part on second Thessalonians, uh, there, they're going to be addressing and they're going to say it's Christ's ministry that has to be taken out of the way. Now we know that Christ's ministry is counterfeited by the papacy, but it's not taken out of the way and cast down to the earth. That is, that does injustice to the idea that the daily is paganism and the transgression of desolation is papalism. If you make the daily being Christ's ministry, that's the problem, right? So, but there is some truth in it, right? There is some things that were being noticed, but in, in order to fit those truths in, the, the truth of Christ being our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, they had to undo something that they didn't fully understand. And part of that is because of not understanding the 2520. If they had understood the 2520 and its relation to the 2300 days, they would never have had the new view of the day. But we do know that Christ's seat is usurped. 
It doesn't mean that Christ has to be moved out of the way. That doesn't mean he's the daily. Right? Christ's seat is usurped by you know papal Rome, right? That's that's what it's doing. And and that plainly tells us that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So I, I think the seat here needs to be Christ's seat. That in the place of Christ, but as for the Almighty God, his place, his seat is going to be honored with this false god, with these idols in, in the historical application. So our time is up. So we need to think about that. So we'll think about that. So we have this option. The seat is either Christ's seat or the seat is the Pantheon. And we're going to come together tomorrow and we're going to look at it in a bit more detail. Any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study this morning and for the participation and uh, the way that you have helped us to think through this. We ask for your continued help throughout this day and that when we look at this again tomorrow morning, that you can give us clear insight. We pray for one another. Help us in our day-to-day trials. And um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.